you know, we do have something to shout about, <laughs> and that is it is Friday, but Sunday is coming. Amen. Come on, let's say it again. Say it's Friday. Yeah, but Sunday is coming. Amen. Good morning and welcome to our virtual Good Friday message for today. Uh, you know, there are untold numbers of preachers who have preached, taught, spoken, and will be this weekend as well from some version of the topic is Friday, but Sunday is coming. It is a statement of encouragement. And it is quite fitting and quite descriptive for the Friday before Easter, commonly referred to as Good Friday. Good Friday is in recognition of and reference to the suffering and the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. This past Wednesday, on Ash Wednesday, we talked about Holy Week, a week of tragedy and triumph, and how Jesus had a week unlike any other. But within that week is a day called Good Friday. And if we call Holy Week a rough week, we would have to call Good Friday a rough day. Amen. And indeed, it was a rough day. It is to be recognized as a sad and solemn day, a day of mourning, a day of uh, anguish, because for a minute, he was with us. He walked with us and he talked with us. And then in an instance, he was gone. He was gone, but praise be to God, not for long. Amen. So tracking his week, we find that Jesus experienced rejection. He experienced uh, condemnation. He was mocked and ridiculed, disrespected, prosecuted, and persecuted. Jesus was denied by Peter, betrayed by Judas, and will later be doubted by Thomas. He was abandoned by most at the cross. The reality is that his short life on earth really was no easy journey. You know, he once retreated to the Garden of Gethsemane with his inner circle only to have them fall asleep during his hour of suffering. It was there that the pain of what lay before him became unbearable. And he requested of the Father to release him from that cup of bitterness. Let this cup pass from me. During this week, he has had to endure doubts about his divinity. He has had to tolerate verbal and physical abuse. And it all culminates with this day. Good Friday. Yes, this Friday where he was humiliated, falsely accused, dragged from one courtroom to another. He was first cleared, but then convicted. Pilate said himself, he finds no fault in him. But yet, bowing to the wishes of the religious elite, he condemns him to death, to die on the cross. After Jesus is stripped and beaten and mocked, he is forced to carry the very cross from which he will hang until death. I'm telling you, it's a terrible week and it's a terrible day. But through it all, Jesus never complained. And as the old saying goes, he never said a mumbling word. Then finally, arriving out on that stench-filled, blood-soaked hill called Golgotha, the place of executions, he is fastened to the old rugged cross. He is fastened there by ropes, <clears throat> by nails, and by spikes. But he is also fastened there by both love and hate. It is hatred that put him there. But it is love that kept him there. Amen. A hole has already been prepared. Perhaps one that has been used many times before. And once lifted high on that cross, it is dropped into that hole. No doubt with a loud thud dropping with his weight and the weight of the cross. And they left him there to be made sport of and to be toyed with. But you and I, we are encouraged by those immortal words that he spoke when he said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. You know, but as I look at that scene, amazingly, most of his followers are nowhere to be found. Not even his disciples, most of them are nowhere to be found. 
not even those whom he has healed and raised from the dead. And except for a few of the faithful, isn't that the, always the way it is? Isn't that usually the way it is that only there are only a faithful few who are left? And he was left to endure his cross basically alone. You know, it must be a terrible feeling to have to walk that last mile alone. Many people have had to even experience that this past year. People have had to go through suffering and death, dying without their loved ones, without their friends being around, around them, not only not being around them, but not even being able to visit with them. And really, in many cases, not even able to be there in their death. No funeral, no time to spend with them. And as I look out there on the cross, and as Jesus hangs there, he is taunted, called on to come down from the cross. They are down there yelling, come down if you be the king of the Jews. You know, they're thinking you got all this power, you're some great king, take yourself down off the cross. But as the songwriter would say, it was love that kept him there. Amen. It was love that kept him there. But let me tell you something, my friend, and I, I totally agree with that. But more than that, listen, it was your sins that kept him there. It was my sins that kept him there. Not just love, but it was our sin that kept him there. Basically, you and I nailed him to the cross with our sins. And as I look there on the cross, as I look up and I watch him as he hangs there, you know, and I look and then see from the crown of thorns that has been firmly placed upon his head, there's blood dripping from his brow. Then there runs a soldier up there as if thinking he will finish him off. A soldier comes and pierces Jesus in the side with a spear. But apparently he missed the memo. He didn't get the email. Well, Jesus says, therefore, doth my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it up again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I lay it down willingly. I have power to lay it down and I have the power to take it up again. You know, in the final stages of his humanity, there are a few words that were uttered from the cross. And we have coined them the last seven words of Christ. Of course, meaning his last seven statements from the cross. And I admit it is another one of those traditions, uh, uh, but a good one for us to arrange his words in some order. In order that we might uh, remember them and in order that we might inspire and encourage one another in our darkest hours. When we look at what Jesus spoke from the cross in his dying moments, he, he was still ministering to the people. He was still reaching out to us, trying to encourage us and trying to inspire us. And even in the midst of dying, he was saving lives. Amen. I'm talking about spiritual lives. I'm talking about salvation. And the first word, as we call it, the first phrase, the first statement, uh, as we have arranged them, spoken from the cross by Jesus, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You find that in Luke 23 and 34. And Jesus, listen, even on his deathbed, so to speak, he is still asking the Father to forgive the people because they really didn't know exactly what they were doing. Aren't you glad that no matter what Jesus is going through, he still has time to call on the Father that you and I might be forgiven for our sins? Aren't you glad that he took time out from dying to look after you and me? He says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Then the second word or the second statement as we again have arranged them because as he hangs there, there's one to his left, there's another to his right. And, um, and one asks Jesus, says, listen, I want you to remember me. And Jesus says, today shall I be with me in paradise. What does he do? He takes time that, that, that he calls on the Father to forgive us of our sins. And he takes time to save our souls, even in the midst of his own dying. 
even in the midst of his own death. He takes time out in order to uh, hear the cry of a, of a guilty party. Not one who is making excuses for his sins and his wrongdoing, but one who's already fessed up. Yes, I'm wrong. I've been wrong. I did wrong. I sinned. But Jesus says, fret not, fear not. Today, this very day, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Amen. You find that in Luke 23 and 43. And I'm glad that Jesus remembers us even in the midst of his pain and his suffering. The third word or the third statement, if you will, the third phrase that Jesus, as, as again, was we have uh, the way in which we have ordered them. Uh, uh, we find in that third word uh, uh, that Jesus says, woman, behold thy son, looking at his good friend, amen, John, <laughs> Uh, amen. He, he says, uh, and, you know, John is the one who is considered, uh, you know, he, he thought of himself as being closer to Jesus than anybody else. And, and, and you got to admit, he's still there at the cross. He's there with Jesus. And Jesus looks at his mother, Mary, and says, woman, behold thy son. He is com committing uh, 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 John uh, to be cared for by his own mother. In other words, Jesus is saying, your son is leaving, but take John. Amen. He, he says, take John. Woman, behold thy son. And then it says to John, even behold thy mother. Amen. Look at what Jesus is doing on the cross, hanging there, suffering, dying in pain. And yet, you know what's on his mind? You, me. But he's not all the way out of his humanity yet. No, he, he does have the, the, he has his divinity, but he's not all the way out of humanity yet. And that fourth word, that fourth phrase, that fourth statement, Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? You find that in Mark 15 and 34. Why does Jesus call out to the Father and say, why has thou forsaken me? He calls out because this is a, a, a moment, a, 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 a moment in his life that he feels, and he is, being separated from his father. You know, because of your sins and because of my sins. So he says, Father, why, why, why have you left me out here? Why have you put me out here? Why have you forsaken me? And it's really a quote from the Old Testament. He says, why? A, a prophetic, prophetic word from the Old Testament. Jesus says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Amen. And then as we move on, watching him make the transition throughout that day on that Friday, still uh, in his humanity, Jesus says, I thirst. You find that in John 19 and 28. Jesus says, I thirst. I'm thirsty. You know, and even then, you know, one of the soldiers ran up and gave him basically what we would call vinegar. To drink was not trying to quench his thirst, but made matters even worse. And yet Jesus hung there. Then the sixth word that Jesus spoke or the sixth statement that he made as we have arranged them is he says that it is finished. You'll find that in John 19 and 30. He says it is finished. And uh, in a sense, he was saying it is over. it was over, but it was not over. But he was saying in making this transition from life to death. That part of it is finished. He, he, said, he is speaking about what is about to take place. And that brings us to our seventh word or our seventh statement where he says, Father, into thy hands, I commend my spirit. You find that in Luke 23 and 46. And basically what Jesus was saying, Father, Father, I'm giving my life. I'm placing my life into your hands. Amen. He says, Father, I uh, I, I commend my spirit into your hands. I give you my life. You remember what he said? He says, listen, no man takes my life. We look at the soldiers. We, we look at those who, at Pilate, who condemned Jesus to death. But Jesus was not murdered. And the reality is, he was not killed. He laid down his life. And he said, if I lay it down, I can pick it up again. If I have power to lay down my life, I also have the power to take it up again. Amen. So as we, as we go through this Good Friday, as we watch Jesus hang there on the cross, and as we uh, witness him making that transition from 
uh, life to death and then, and I know I'm getting ahead of myself, and then back to life again on, <laughs> early on that Sunday morning. Amen. Amen. I, I want to speak in particular, I want to talk about it and speak on um, on uh, the attention and the focus uh, and the emphasis that uh, during this particular period of time, during this Easter week, Holy Week, that, that is placed on the mental, emotional, and physical suffering and death of Jesus Christ. I mean, because when you look at it, we go to great lengths to talk about uh, how they how they slapped him, how they spat on him. We highlight uh, the carrying of the cross, that burden of the cross on his shoulders up that dreadful hill called Calvary. We are careful to mention the nails in his hands, the spikes in his feet, the crown of thorns upon his head. And we are always careful to mention the piercing of the spear in his side. Sometimes even we dramatize these events either on screen or on the stage. And certainly these are incidents that are to be noted and given proper attention and consideration. But recognizing the suffering and the death of Jesus Christ on the cross can never be limited to his physical death uh, uh, and, and all his physical suffering. It can never be misunderstood as the means by which we are saved. I hope you hear me, my friend, because I got to admit to you, I must confess to you that there are times that we as preachers and ministers of the gospel and teachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I believe, have placed far too much emphasis on the physical suffering and the physical death of Jesus Christ. But we, my friends, are not saved by what Jesus endured on a physical level. Can I help you out today? No, we aren't saved because his hands were hurting. We are not saved because his side was painful. We aren't saved because they beat him. We are not saved because they spat upon him. We are saved because he hung there under the weight of his own body, enduring your sins and mine. And then even when we go a little bit further and look at the other part of this equation, is the uh, attempt, to, attempt to prove the death of Jesus Christ on the cross by pointing or prove not only the death but his resurrection from the dead by pointing to the, the, the tomb. And we attempt to prove this by offering as evidence an empty tomb. And that is scriptural. That is in the Bible. It is according to the word of God that when they came, they found that there was an empty tomb. But let me tell you something, my friend. There are a lot of reasons that that tomb could have been empty. There are, there are many reasons why uh, he could that, that he may not have been found there. And I know that there were guards outside the tomb, and I understand that, and I believe the word of God. But let me also tell you this, my friend. We don't accept the truth of the resurrection of Christ from the dead, based on evidence presented, we accept his death and burial and resurrection by faith. Amen. We walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. I feel you. I understand. And many of us are convinced of his resurrection because we agree with the songwriter who said, I know he lives because he lives in my heart. He lives within me. And I know he lives because he does live within me. But the physical and emotional pain and suffering are not to be ignored, but the, nor should we place too much emphasis on the physical aspect to the neglect of the spiritual mission that was accomplished on the cross. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he didn't agonize over the pain of the nails. He was not afraid of hanging on the cross. The spirit didn't frighten him. The physical and verbal and mental abuse didn't move him. Humanly speaking, millions of people have endured much more physical pain and suffering than Jesus ever did. That's just the reality of it, my friend. There are people who've gone through much more uh, uh, than, than Jesus did on the cross, physically speaking. Amen. The real tragedy here, the real tragedy here, and the real challenge for Jesus is not 
enduring the pain of the thorns and the spear or the nails, but it is a suffering and uh, and the spiritual separation from the Father. Because in order for Jesus to save you and me of our sins, he had to take our sins upon him. And in that instance, he lost connection with the Father, so to speak. He was separated from the Father because he was bearing our sins. Amen. He was bearing your sins and my sins and the sins of the entire world upon his shoulders. That's what got to him. The focus here should be on the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. Him placing himself in our place. He died that you and I might live. If you gain nothing else from our message today, my friend, please understand and please, of course it was painful to have nails in your hands and spikes in your feet. Of course that's painful. It's painful to hang there on an old rugged cross on a Friday afternoon. Of course that's painful. It's painful when people hit you and stick you with thorns. That's painful. I understand that, my friend. But it is nothing in comparison to the sins, your sins, my sins, the weight of the sins of the world placed upon the shoulders of Jesus Christ. That's what this day is all about. That's what makes it good. <laughs> you know, so how do you call a dreadful, painful Friday, Good Friday? That's how you call it Good Friday. Because it was all done for you and for me. It wasn't just the nails. I know we say, you know, it was the nails. And, and again, it's, it wasn't just the love. Obviously, the love was there. But it was our sins. Jesus not only went to the cross because he loves us, but he went to the cross because he wanted to save us from our sins. Amen. Go on now and enjoy this wonderful Good Friday. But remember what we normally say during the Christmas season. Remember the reason for the season. The reason for Easter season, the reason for Resurrection Sunday, the reason for the crucifixion is your sins and my sins were taken upon Jesus Christ. He sacrificed. He was our substitute. Amen. And therefore, we ought to rejoice. May God continue to bless you. May God continue to keep you is my prayer. Easter Sunday is coming. It's Friday. It's dark. It's dreary. It's painful. It's tragic. But thank God, Sunday. <laughs> Amen. I'm ready to shout right now. Sunday is coming. Amen. And I'm looking forward to seeing you Sunday too. You know, we always say, if you don't go to church any other time, you ought to go on Easter Sunday. <laughs> but I hope and pray that I see you on Sunday morning in our in-person worship at 945 Easter program or Easter presentation during the Sunday school hour at 9 a.m. Come on by and join us. We'll be glad to have you. God bless you and God keep you. Father, we thank you for the work that Jesus did on the cross. We thank you, God, that he died for our sins and rose for our justification. Bless now and keep us in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, my friend. Stay